Welcome to the St Andrews Debating Society, the oldest and some might say finest of its kind. Here. The motion that stands before the House this evening is that this House believes that demo uh, democracy is not the solution to climate change. We are joined by some excellent speakers tonight, Lydia Cole on the proposition side and Alistair Ryder on the opposition side. Before we begin this debate, I invite the Public Debate Secretary to read last week's minutes in the style of Greta Thunberg. How dare you! You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty promises! Why? How dare you! <laughs> Such a terrible Greta Thunberg impression. <laughs> How dare you criticise Anna and her brilliant impression! There seems to be some disagreement in the House, so we'll have to take a vote by oral acclamation. Ooh. All those in favour of taking the minutes uh, as read say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. Seems rather close. I must consult with my sergeant. Aye. The minutes are taken as read. Resign. Oh, sorry. Without any further ado, I give the call to the proposition speaker to give their address to spelling the motion that stands in their name. Stay here. and sustainable development. And I'm speaking today, um, as in fact I speak every day, um, in my capacity as an ecologist and an environmental geographer, trying to understand how we, as humans, can interact with our environment in a more responsible way, um, or, if possible, sustainable way. I'm not a political ecologist, um, let alone a political scientist, so my understandings of the concept and reality of democracy is relatively limited, uh, especially outside of the UK political context. Um, so please bear that in mind and forgive me if my argument and examples are not addressing the diversity of situations across the world. And I look forward to contributions of you all, audience members, um, when we open up the discussion. Despite that disclaimer, I hope that some of the points to my argument will resonate with each of you, whatever your disciplinary background. And some of you might, might see or might side with me by the end, possibly. Um, although, just to mention that I did say to Alexandros in my response email to him that I could actually attempt to argue either for or against this motion. And as a true academic, um, my response when asked to provide a definitive answer was, well, it depends. <laughs> so I look forward to agreeing, um, or perhaps disagreeing agreeably, with the no doubt eloquent and convincing argument that Alistair will put forward in a moment. Um, but on that note, uh, here is my proposition then, in support of this House believes that democracy is not a solution to climate change. So I'm going to start briefly by framing this topic to provide some context to the four points of my argument. So solving climate change is the most complex, wicked problem. Um, defining, or earlier today I was defining with students what a wicked problem is. It's a multi-dimensional challenge that uh, as a consequence seems intractable, near impossible, if not entirely impossible to solve. Hopefully this house, this house believes that we can solve climate change um, but that's a debate for another night. Perhaps we need to manage expectations today as well around how far we get to concluding that related argument. But back to solving climate change, certainly, the, certainly if there is a solution, there is no one solution. Given a chance, different communities in different places will come up with different solutions to the local problems that they're facing. And so if we are to have a chance to solve climate change, we, or those with the power to determine, people, to determine people's futures, need to be open to different perspectives across space and time. So despite me saying that there is no one solution to climate change, um, actually we all know what the basic fix to climate change is. Reducing emissions, uh, reducing the use of fossil fuels, supporting renewable methods of energy production in a responsible way. And alongside that, restoring and nurturing healthy, resilient ecosystems. Because they're the absolute backbone of our physical and mental health, and fundamentally, our ability to exist on this planet. But we, we won't achieve these two things without considering the justice dimension of climate change. Who is experiencing the costs of climate change, 
um, and who's benefiting from the re resource consumption that is leading to climate change. We need to consider this both at the macro and international scale and essentially at the local scale, which constitutes our daily lived reality. Achieving these aspirational goals of reducing the gases that are warming our Earth, nurturing healthy ecosystems and the biodiversity that they contain, and ensuring a fair distribution of the costs and benefits of resource consumption requires informed, wise, compassionate governance of our local to global systems. And a way of achieving that fit for purpose, fit for purpose government is through choosing them. So a bit like the process of evolution by natural selection. We have a choice of political parties of varying levels of fitness, and through the way in which those different parties respond, or at least say they'll respond to different societal issues, such as dealing with climate change or migration, etc., we vote for what we think is the fittest group. The ability for us to vote in who represents us in national decision making is the defining factor of democracy. A system of governing where those who are doing the decision making who hold the power over the state or the country, are acting on the instruction of the people um, or general population of that state. Well, that's how I understand it. Um, there might be political scientists in the room who give a different definition, um, but we'll go with that for now. So in the UK, we have the ability to vote in our leaders. Great, that's great. So the democratic system that we have in the UK allows us to vote in a set of compassionate, wise, rational actors is that clean Conservative Party? <laughs> <laughs> Who are going to represent the whole population and make decisions, create policies that will ensure we all behave in a way that prioritises the long-term health of our planet. Does that resonate with any of you? And is that what's happening now? So I'm going to argue the following four points that illustrate how this best-case scenario is very far from the reality of what we're experiencing at the moment. I'm going to talk about lack of suitable leadership, the incompatible temporal dimension of our political system, the challenge of access to information when it comes to voting in support of climate change policies, and then finally the fallacy of representation in our so-called democratic system. So, lack of, um, lack of suitable leadership. How many inspirational leaders do people know in government? Just put your hand up if there's somebody in government at the moment or somebody who you think could be the Prime Minister, bearing in mind that our political leaders can now be up to 80 plus years old. Um, who, who knows about somebody or trusts that there's somebody in government at the moment who could be Prime Minister? Some people know some people. That's good. Um, good. So a leader um, is somebody who actively adheres to the, uh, the central principle of democracy that state power is actually being vested in the people or the general population of the state. I'm going to read a quote now from a paper from the Institute for Local Government. A central responsibility for public officials is to make decisions that are in the community's interest. This is the essence of leadership in a representative democracy. Another important responsibility for decision makers is stewardship of decision making process. This involves making sure that the process is fair that all points of view are treated with respect. And then it goes on to talk about trustworthy information about the impacts, both positive and negative, um, need to be provided to the population. And the leaders themselves, of course, need to be trustworthy. Um, that means telling the truth, acknowledging mi mistakes, and being guided by what serves the community's interest, not the leader's personal or political interest. Presently, in the UK, I would argue that the party that is in power that's been voted in through a democratic process does not possess a leader with those qualities um, in any of the roles which have influence on developing policy to mitigate climate change. <coughs> and I look forward to anybody enlightening me on a conservative politician that I've maybe underestimated. So I'm open to hearing about that later. As well as a suitable leader or set of leaders, we need a functioning system which won't be independent um, that, that, and that functioning system won't be independent of those leaders. We only have to look at our neighbours over in Northern Ireland to see the damage caused to society when a functioning government is absent and where there's no one around to make decisions. But hopefully now that Stormont and the Northern Ireland Assembly, which has the decision-making powers for that state, have been re-established after about seven years of a government vacuum, 
leaders can start to repair public services and look towards the environment. So my second point, and I'm not sure how much time I've got, that's very easy, um, is about the time dimension. So electoral cycles, um, they have up to a five year term, well in the UK we have up to a five year term for the government controlling Westminster before another election is called. During a party's time in office, they're looking to make as many people as happy as possible, as quickly as possible. So they vote um, so that those people will vote for the same party after the end of their term. Feelings of happiness, or at least satisfaction, among the voting public often result from improved standards of living. So more houses, uh, cheaper travel to sunny places, lower council tax, and lots of other factors that almost are entirely incompatible, at first sight anyway, with investing in longer term changes that will reduce emissions and nurture the environment. We might think about air travel as being one of those key ones. Restoring ecosystems back to health, such as peatlands, which are my, my pet um, and professional passion, requires commitment both financially and in terms of infrastructure over up to 100 years. So that might be 20 electoral cycles. Most governments aren't thinking along those lines, um, let alone investing resources that could be directed towards efforts to keep them in power um, for longer. So, they can, so that they can be powerful for longer, for whatever reasons that they quote in their manifesto as being the reason why they want to be um, in power. So we need long, longer term thinking in tune with ecological dynamics to be incorporated in more of our policy making. So perhaps on that point, a benevolent dictatorship might lead to more sustainable action over time. Um, again, perhaps someone can argue against or for that later. Given that I probably am entirely out of time, um, I'm going to say very quickly about prioritisation. So another point of my argument is that what information do people have in order to vote, in order to vote in their best interest? The press are really influencing the information that's available at the moment. Um, we're not communicating science, um, engaging the public in our research in a way that is enabling them to make decisions that might improve their lives. Uh, that's the point around information available through which to vote um, in a democratic system, and then representation of the whole population. So a democratic system is relying on everybody having a voice. But is everybody invited to the table? If you're under 18, you're not allowed to vote, yet the future, um, you're going to have to deal with the mess that our future, uh, that we are creating by how we vote now. Um, if we allowed all of those students that were part of Fridays for Future, to vote, then how different maybe would our, um, our government system or those governing our um, country be now? And so the final point um, is that yes, if democracy, capital D, um, is allowed to function um, in the way that it's meant to on the tin, then perhaps I would be voting against. Um, but as it stands in reality and in the way that our um, society is set up, I do believe that democracy is not the solution to climate change. I have a speaker for their excellent address, and I'll cross to four and give the call to the opposition speaker to give their address and uh, begin the case of the opposition bench. Stay here. Ladies and gentlemen, President, I thank you for the invitation to speak in response to the motion proposed by my colleague, Dr. Lydia Cole. I do not accept the wording of the proposed motion, and so I'm asking you this evening to reject categorically this suggestion that democracy is not the solution to climate change. There are two reasons for insisting on this. Firstly, why should we think for a second that there is just one solution to climate change? This is a simplistic, technocratic way of thinking that overlooks the multifaceted, multidimensional nature of this phenomenon we call climate change. 
Is climate change a matter of grave and pressing concern for all societies across the globe and for the many wonderful ecosystems the planet supports? Yes. Is climate change exacerbating global inequality and further colonializing the impoverished global majority by the world's richest nations? Yes. So is there a single solution, a fix? No, there is not. It might make for good sloganeering to suggest that there is a straightforward answer. Claiming that there is might be a practical and rhetorically useful way of goading people to adopt a specific action. But beware of anybody who tells you that the answer to a difficult and intractable issue is straightforward. Like it's a marketing scam on the internet, if something is too good to be true, then it probably is. The journey to alleviate the social and environmental challenges of climate change will be protracted. It is likely to take centuries, and it may never be concluded. It will involve an uncountable number of solutions, not just one. It will involve thousands of policy initiatives and international agreements which will dominate our politics throughout our lives and for those who come after us. And most of the solutions that we help shape and which will be proposed will seem clumsy and provisional and temporary. It will involve compromise after compromise. You see, the frame is climate change, which is referenced in tonight's proposal, refers to a whole array of meanings, and indeed that was corroborated by what my colleague Dr. Coles recently said. Climate change refers to values and suppositions. Of course, I accept its reality, but we need to accept that it is also an ideologically constructed grand narrative that stands for a very wide array of massive contemporary social and environmental problems. In general conversation, climate change refers to an addiction to an economic system that encourages hyper-consumption. It refers to a dependence on an unsustainable energy source and a consequent reliance on despotic regimes who control them. It suggests rising food insecurity in the face of increasing erratic weather, wholesale harvest failure and famine, deforestation, desertification, flooding, biodiversity loss, mass migration, and acute social inequality. When we say the word climate change, it sounds like a single thing, but it is a wicked problem. But as a single thing, when we say that word, we come to think of it as one big problem that needs one massive solution. Yes, we can break down climate change into a simple idea, something that is easily quantified, and then we can fixate on a single policy target, like the idea of restricting global atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions to below a specified target number. But even if there were a magical way of switching off all greenhouse gas emissions tonight, it would be delusional to assume that when we wake up in the morning, all the associated issues that accompany climate change will be resolved. Climate change is not just a crisis for the environment. It is also a crisis for local and global governance, for how we do politics in general. The main reason why we should reject the motion that there is one solution to climate change is because it encourages us to believe that somewhere out there, there is a saviour. Someone or something who can rid us of this terrible affliction. There is no such prophet, and there is no single techno fix. To be tempted by the idea that there might be leads us into very dangerous ways of thinking. And this brings me around to the matter of democracy and to the mistaken assumption that it is a hindrance, something that is dispensable. It is not. The second reason I give you tonight 
for rejecting the motion is that the phrasing suggests that democracy is a problem. But democracy is certainly not the problem. To point an accusatory finger at democracy is to indict the least culpable factor in this matter. Yes, it is tempting to conclude that the reason why national and international climate governance is struggling to reach a consensus and to advance more rapidly towards mitigating the effects of climate change is down to liberal democracies liberal regimes, principally in the wealthy Northern Hemisphere, so the argument might run, makes it impossible for the international community to drive forward the kinds of political and social reforms that climate mitigation requires. But this is a line of thinking that is wrong on two fronts. Firstly, it misinterprets the real reason why progress is frustrated which is thanks to the anti-democratic lobbying might of the fossil fuel industry. And secondly, it assumes that climate change governance would be accelerated if decisions were imposed with greater authority from some centralized power. The idea that eco-authoritarianism will solve climate change once and for all is fanciful, and in my mind, a nightmarish thought. Democracy is not a straightforward principle to define. Over the centuries, it has meant different things to different societies. I don't want to get embroiled in the more detailed arguments about how it is enacted as a system of governance in different nation states. But I hold firmly to the belief that democracy is a necessary element of all good government, and that if a democratic impulse is absent from a political system, then the decisions that are reached are inferior, the system is more prone to corruption, and all parties are impoverished. As an ideal, democracy stands for the principle that ordinary people can improve their lives by becoming political beings, and by making collective power answerable to their needs. It's about the collective management of powers that directly affect the lives of others and of oneself. Democracy only flourishes in cultures that support it. It has to be cultivated at all levels, and it is all too easily undermined. It depends on principles of equality, truth-telling, and independent thinking. It requires everyone in a society to become an active citizen. And this means caring for the well-being of the collective. A democratic ethos involves learning to discuss controversial issues in a mutually respectful fashion. It means learning the skills of advocacy. It involves becoming a participant, not a bystander, in public or institutional affairs. It also means respecting the obligation to speak the truth and remaining answerable to laws and protocols that are applicable to all. If it is effective, then it is a system of governance that allows for peaceable, peaceable compromises to be reached that benefit the collective, not just the select few. Without a democratic element in governance, there is no obligation to be inclusive no real requirement to pay attention to the needs of all members of the community. The voices of the minority group can be more easily overlooked or even ignored. Decisions can be made centrally without any consultation and dissenting voices can be silenced by force if necessary. Would you genuinely prefer to live in such a society? It would be mad to suggest that democracy is the one solution to the problem of climate change. As a phenomenon, climate change is placing an unbearable strain on societies. It is exacerbating social inequality, and this is likely to continue. Antisocial, xenophobic forces of self-interest and self-preservation are only likely to grow stronger in the decades to come. So why on earth would we abandon the one impulse in modern governance 
that looks to support the interests of the collective, that requires us to pay attention to the interests of others. Because in decision-making processes that respect democratic principles, you simply have to heed the requirements and concerns of others in the group. You are forced to listen. Before it's too late, let's continue to cultivate the spirit of democracy wherever it might arise. As a member of a debating society that is founded on democratic principles, I call on you to respect the values of your own institution and to reject categorically this ill-worded motion. I thank the speaker for that excellent address, and thank you to all speakers for what has been a fantastic debate so far. It is now time to open the debate up to the floor. To capture chairs, I please raise your hand. Speech will be up to three minutes in length, and I'll bang my gavel once your time has expired. So, anyone want to give... Yes, please state your name for the minutes. Hello, my name is uh, Diane Dupin Mobley. Um, I would like to bring up the idea that um, democracy as an ideal is not entirely functional with the economic system that we have throughout most of the world. Um, sorry. Um, I think the idea that you can have a democratic system in countries like the West that have um, an enormous economic and social influence over the rest of the world is a bit naive um, when thinking on a global scale in that the impact of democratic systems in the West undemocratically affects the rest of the world, often where the effects of climate change are more prominent, um, specifically around the sort of tropical areas. And, and so I think while appealing to the ideal notion of maintaining democratic systems um, is nice and, you know, could be useful if we had a more equitable global system. When you have uh, a, a capitalist hierarchy that um, allows for people with lobbying power and with the economic resources to support the continual um, overconsumption of both fossil fuels and also things, other sort of materials that um, degrade our planet and our resources. I think it's um, essentially impossible to have a functioning democratic system where either the people who get to vote are not completely misinformed through the power of um, propaganda and media and also through um, the just the rhetoric of politicians who are often bought by those same interests. And so while a collective and democratic spirit is should be the ideal, and if it were spread across the world and not used to maintain the hegemony of Western powers um, in the same way that it has been, it would be great to have democracy. And unfortunately, I think there would have to be a much more powerful economic revolution before that could really be functional. Thank you. I thank the members for their floor speech. Uh, any speeches from the floor? Yes, the gentleman at the back. Please state your name for the minutes. Hi, Derek. I'm Simon. Um, I somewhat agree with Diane. I think it's not great to combine, to, to think that democracy is going to bring a solution to climate change, but for a different reason. Um, I don't think the reason why democratic states are bad at solving climate change is because they're capitalist oligarchies. Maybe they are, but I think that's irrelevant. I think, I mean, look at put the biggest polluters in the world right now in terms of fossil fuel emissions, China and India, one's a, an autocracy, one's a democracy. Both of them resolutely stick to their goals to industrialize using coal-fired plants. I think they do that, both countries, because they realize that the mass majority of their populations want that because industrialization through fossil fuels makes them richer and brings them out of poverty. I think this 
is a really big problem if you support democracy. Because democracy, I mean, we say this word and we assume it's a good thing. And like, yes, it's a good thing because we want people's voices to be heard. But people vote in, in the developing world and in the developed world. They vote for candidates who make their lives better. And if your country is unindustrialized, the way to make your life better is to build factories. And the cheapest way to build factories isn't through wind farms, unfortunately. It's not through solar panels. It's through coal emitting and oil um, using plants, and that's a fact of life, and I would like to ask the opposition who defends democracy to explain it. I can't remember for the floor speech. Are there any other speeches on the floor? Yes, please state your name for the minute. I'm Rahel. Um, well, first of all, I can definitely see how someone might think that democracy could be a problem for solving climate change in a fast and efficient way because I feel, I feel like democracy can be incredibly slow. Um, I'm from Germany, so we can see that it re takes a really uh, a long time to uh, buy uh, to build many wind turbines and stuff like that. It's taking very long, and you have to take people's opinions into account who might not want to have these wind turbines in their backyard. Um, so I can see how uh, one might think, oh, well, if we have like an echo dictator, we can just build um, all of these uh, things very fast. We could just um, rule out fossil fuels and everything um, would work out really, really well. But, um, well, as the opposition mentioned, um, well, climate change has multi different facets to it. And um, while it might make climate change less bad, I think that might not really be the thing that we actually want. Because first of all, how can we trust this dictator? Um, they might change their opinion and then we have a problem. And then also I think we want our opinions to be taken into account. Then, um, um, but um, I think actually maybe we need more democracy. Um, yeah, you mentioned the flaws of the democratic system at the moment. And I think maybe one solution could be, I used to be a believer that people want to build up these industries. I think a lot of people actually want to have good climate policies, but they want it um, to be um, to work for their um, social needs as well. So I think we might uh, need to take um, more people's opinions into account, maybe through things like citizen council, where you have randomly selected people who then uh, sit together with experts, and maybe you could even bring people from the global south into it. Um, however, that would work in the um, political system. But I think um, we need to actually have more democracy and work together with the citizens to see what kind of solutions would work for everyone. Um, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. I remember the floor speech, and the speech is on the floor. Yes, state your name for the minute. Uh, thank you, my name is George. Um, and I'd just like to say that I very strongly disagree with this notion. Firstly, because I think the countries at the moment that are doing the most to tackle climate change are democracies. And so it clearly shows that actually democracies, democracy, while it may not be a simple solution to climate change, is certainly absolutely no impediment to taking action to solve climate change. The UK's per capita emissions are lower than any point since the 18, 18, 1880s. Um, the European Union has some of the most ambitious climate change targets of any large um, uh, international bloc or country. Uh, many of the most ambitious countries, such as Scandinavian countries, are also some of the most democratic countries in the world. Um, this might not show that democracy is necessarily the solution to climate change. It certainly does sh show that democracy doesn't stop a country from taking action on climate change. But something else that's always brought up in this debate is the fact that many political leaders might decide to make short-term decisions um, which make action to tackle climate change harder um, in order to gain popularity. And there are lots of examples of this. For example, Rishi Sunak putting back the date by which you uh, can only buy electric or hydrogen cars. Um, the only problem with these sorts of arguments is that these movements and these policies are unpopular. The Conservatives at the moment, at the moment are unpopular. Lots of the anti-environmentalist movements around Europe at the moment, while they may have a very significant section of the population very vocally supporting them, are, with the large majority of the population, unpopular. Most people 
certainly most voters want to tackle climate change because they believe in the science, they are convinced of the science, and so they vote for parties which say they want to tackle climate change. That is one of the reasons why democracies have made so much progress in the last 10 or 20 years. And so it cannot possibly be the case that, certainly cannot possibly be the case, that democracy is any impediment to action um, to tackle climate change. It may even be the case that because these green policies are overall popular, democracy can be a solution. Thank you. Can I remember for the floor speech, then the speech is on the floor. Yes, the person at the back. Hello. So I think I share a similar annoyance with, uh, with the two speakers about the question itself. Um, because, no, I, I agree, there is no one solution, obviously. But I've interpreted this um, motion as being, to what extent, or does democracy have any place with a solution for climate change? Now, there's actually a very simple and maybe much rather bitter pill you could swallow to uh, agree with that motion, which is that, well, actually none of the political systems we have are going to be a good solution um, to help solve climate change. That's kind of a, just a very, very bitter pill. Other people so far have said that democracies are actually doing the best good so far, but the sad truth there is that, well, they may be doing the best, but they are still not doing anywhere near enough. Um, and obviously the largest producers, producers are countries which um, have dodgy histories with democracies. Now, I would like to outline a point that even, it's very easy to say, well, there is no solution, but then what do we do now? Uh, now, in my view, a problem with democracies and solving climate change is the longer we put off a good plan and an adequate, adequate plan, because obviously all the plans we are implementing now are inadequate, uh, the more likely it is that we'll have to resort to some kind of environmental despotism later on. Um, which is the main fear and warning sign that we should be afraid of. Now, on that final note, I would say that there is still a place for democracies in solving climate change, but it need, they need to be far more radical and the people themselves need to be far more in favour of it. Because I would also highlight that primarily the reason why we care so much about this question and probably why we're talking about it now is because we live in a democracy in which people's voices are heard. And I may be biased for being a Democrat or very pro-democracies, but I think people's voices are only really heard in democracies. Thank you. So I remember the floor speech, then there were speeches from the floor. Oh. <laughs> we'll go with the uh, person in the green jumper then. Uh, yeah, so... I'd like to raise some doubts about democracy as a, as a solution for climate change. I don't think it's like in principle incompatible, and I also don't want to commit to the idea that the, any other system is better. Like previous, uh, uh, agreeing with the previous speech, maybe all systems are going to have problems, but I just want to raise some. Uh, it's hard to get. I, the problem I broadly have is with the sort of populist narrative that sometimes arises often on the left that like climate change is like mostly just the fault of sort of oil oligarchs or whatever. Not that these people are helping this, the situation. I mean, it's hard to give an assessment of voters that isn't just sort of cherry picking. You've heard people say, you know, people like green policy, people want to stop climate change, people believe in climate change. Well, this is true of some voters, but you also have a large number of Republicans in America who don't believe that climate change is real. You have people in America who live in West Virginia who want to keep coal plants alive because they work in those coal plants. So I think people as voters will often be self-interested to a large extent. It's a, Thing that's sort of most proximate to their, their everyday experience, uh, and that can often lead to voters being bad, right? As well as good. But you know, those are just some very simple reasons why voters are not going to make great decisions about climate change, even if neither are oligarchs or are autocrats, right? Climate change is very complicated. It's a very technocratic problem in a lot of ways, not purely technocratic, but you need to figure out ways to change your energy system, what kind of trade offs you need to make, etc. On the contrast, most voters don't know that much about all of those things, the complexity of the science, the complexities of economics, etc. I mean, this is just, to some extent, a general problem with democracy, but it's particularly acute in an issue like this, which is extremely complicated. So they're probably not going to necessarily be able to 
pressure governments to make the right decisions, particularly on the details, even if they broadly think that democracy is good, right? So they don't have the time to spare, they don't have the expertise to know what to do. But this also just makes them particularly vulnerable to things like manipulation, right? Yeah, you know, some stuff comes from stuff like lobbying, but you know, a lot of it comes from media being able to convince people that climate change isn't real or that they can have half measures or whatever. And people might say, well, all those things are a perversion of democracy, getting in the way of this and what's going on. But that starts to me to sound like, you know, when people say we've never tried true communism or whatever, right? Most systems like are going to come up against other problems which are going to make them harder to function. And there's a question about whether the system is robust. I think the problem is, is that when voters don't know that much about climate change, when as I said earlier, they're often maybe somewhat self-interested, or when you have motivated reasonings, so you don't really want to have to sacrifice you know, eating meat or paying more tax or whatever to have your uh, have climate change. And when politicians can take advantage of that and sell you a kind of easy narrative, an idea that there's no trade-offs, you, you know, you can have all the energy you want and all of the climate, uh, and no climate problems, people unfortunately often take that. So yeah, once again, I'm not saying that we should install dictatorships, but I just think it is reasonable to be quite pessimistic about democracy and how it will uh, interact with trying to solve climate change. I remember the floor speech, uh, speech is on the floor. Yeah, state your name for the minute. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jay Nevin, and I'm going to try and build on the point that George so eloquently put. My questions for the uh, proposition. You use the phrase, everyone is invited to the table, in your fourth point, shortly after suggesting that benevolent, benevolent dictatorship could be a viable alternative. Such a juxtaposition seems bizarre to me. Resting the future of the environment on the whims of one person could be catastrophic. While democracy isn't perfect, and often abused by elective leadership, there's still numerous benefits. Democracy is working for the people, by the people. And there's no more of a pressing issue than those in the environment that affect so many, especially those in the lower social economic class. In a democracy, people can use the courts to hold the government to account. In the UK, this process is known as public interest litigation. as a vital leveller for those without a voice to be heard. Finally, dictatorships are notorious for <coughs> Prioritising short-term gain, albeit power or fiscal gain, this is often to the detriment of the environment. So I ask you again, how can everyone be invited to the table link up with benevolent dictatorship? Thank you. Can the members their floor speech? Any other speeches from the floor? Uh, yes, state your name for the minute. Uh, so I'm Jack, and I think this speech will address some of the earlier speeches and also the idea, the sort of empiric example of democracy are better fighting climate change. And I think that's true up till now. But I think the key point to recognise is that fighting climate change gets more expensive as you go on. This is quite logical, because if there's a hundred forms of different emissions, you naturally as a politician target the ones that are easiest to target first, the ones that are cheapest to target, and the ones that harm people the least first. So therefore, democracies have made huge progress in the West, at combating climate change by making their electricity grids net zero, because that's relatively easy, it doesn't cost people that much, it's mostly just done on government borrowing, a 30 billion pound investment here, and we turn the electricity grid into using on solar panels and hydroelectric, etc. But I think to note is that it gets way more expensive and way more costly to people over time, right? Because once you've solved all the easy stuff, to actually reduce emissions, you have to start implementing things like a meat tax, or phasing out of car combustible engine vehicles in favour of a small amount of still highly polluting EVs, highly taxing things like mass consumer products, mass consumption of clothes. You have to actually consistently change the system in ways that A, cost lots of money, B, that are quite difficult, and C, actually harm the interests of lots of people. So while there's been a broad support in democracies for actually combating climate change so far, i.e. making the electricity grid net zero, a few support systems for inputting EVs, these sorts of quite basic things, only a small, really ideological, dedicated, tiny group of minorities within these states similarly will push for these sorts of measures that are far more harsh and are going to harm them when they're going to actually make it very, very difficult for, say, people in poverty to afford the food that they usually like eating or to drive to work 
or to carry out their lives in a way that makes it easy for them to buy clothes from H&M which they enjoy, or they actually live their lives that way. And I think that to recognize that means that I think that while democracies empirically have been very good at fighting climate change so far, I don't think that they're going to be very good at fighting climate change to the point where actually we solve it or we meaningfully reduce emissions globally, worldwide, by not no longer sort of exporting all our emissions to factories in the global south, which still massively produce all the emissions for places like Denmark. I have a moment for a floor speech and a speech from the floor. Yes, state your name for the minute. Uh, my name is Caleb Silverglad. I'd like to agree with uh, Alistair and the gentleman in the white shirt in the back to challenge not just the wording of the question, but the general proposition that democracy is anything meaningful when it comes to combating climate change. Now, I also agree with uh, the previous speaker that people in democracies and people in government or in states generally are going to have problems with combating climate change when it gets to the very end, when things that are very culturally different from the culture we have now are going to have to change in order for the climate to be fixed, people are going to object, at least right now. Obviously, by the time that, like, more, like, as, we, as society changes, as vegetarianism becomes more popular, that might change. But I think the way that's going to change is not really tied to the interaction between civil society and government, but those two things working separately. So previous members have mentioned that government is going to be doing regulations in order to stop climate change and how civil society is going to be changing in order so that people are supporting the government, so that even in autocracies, or perhaps not autocracies, but less democratic governments like China, uh, civil, civil society will change and the government will change in regulations as well. Now, both of those things can be happening in an organic fashion in a way that just doesn't seem relevant to democracy, especially because most supposedly democratic states, as the speaker uh, for the motion mentioned, aren't really functioning in terms of popular rule, but only in a sort of fiction where the people are choosing these regulations. Uh, the climate change can be fixed. Climate change can be fixed by the interaction of civil society and government, but or by the two civil society and government, but not necessarily by the interaction. And so I uh, urge support for the motion. Another member for their floor speech. Any other final floor speeches? Lady in the blue jumper. Okay, so I have kind of two reasons why I think that we have to believe, or at least it's beneficial for individuals in this house to believe that democracy is the solution to climate change. And the first is this idea that's been kind of talked over a lot about climate change being a so-called wicked problem, in the sense that it's so multifaceted and it's so huge, and I think the majority of the people in this room accept a, that climate change exists and is a reality and is impactful in all of our lives and will be in the future, and secondly, that it is a massive, multifaceted problem and there's so much that needs to be done about it and it's very difficult for any one individual to know where to begin in terms of combating it. And so I think if the majority of this House believes that climate change is a problem that we need to find a solution, I think the majority of this House also has to accept that as an individual, perhaps the most, the most impactful thing that you can do as a, a member of a society that is... Um, democratic is to vote in such a way that you believe that your views are being represented on the world stage in the sense that the majority, we see that there are disproportionate impacts of climate change and the majority of the countries that are emitting the most greenhouse gases are all also countries that are by and large democratic and as an individual in one of those countries I think the mo most impactful thing that you can do is potentially to vote in such a way that you feel that the your, your voice is being represented and that the way in which your country acts on the world stage and the things that your country implements are things that are going to be uh, you know, successful in terms of combating climate change. And the idea that comes into this wicked problem is if we don't have if we don't have this kind of democratic system or we choose to opt out of a democratic system that purports to solve climate change, I think you're kind of left with this existential dread of what is it as an individual that I can do? And I potentially either just tune out to the idea that I can do anything impactful at all, or I actively start doing things that just aren't going to be impactful, but that disrupt the social order in such a way that it kind of gives the idea of um, supporting climate change a bad rep in the first place, in terms of if I feel disenfranchised as a voter, or if I feel that nothing, my vote doesn't make a difference, or that I'm refusing to participate in this democratic system, I then go and start doing things like, you know, potentially, I don't know, gluing myself to a road. And that kind of, or however may impactful that may be, I think most people admit that on a kind of wider sort of global stage, throwing soup at something or gluing myself to something is ultimately just giving the 
kind of movement a bad rep. And I think either you end up, if you don't kind of buy into the system of democracy, you either end up doing things that are actively harmful to the idea that we, climate change is a thing that we need to combat, or you just kind of end up in this kind of existential dread, dread of not doing anything at all. And then the second thing is this idea of, you know, a benevolent, benevolent dictator in the sense that we rely on somebody to kind of come, a sort of knight in shining armour who's going to essentially solve this problem for us. And I think that's difficult on two counts, really. The first being that it's unlikely that that person exists or that's going to happen. Um, not to be a pessimist about, you know, knights in shining armour. Um, <laughs> but also this idea of it, it's a scapegoat. And if it doesn't work, then we're back to square one in terms of a lot of the things that this dictator is probably going to be implementing. Depending on the camera. Um, <laughs> a lot of the things that uh, this person's going to implement are going to be unpopular. They're going to be things like meat taxes, and so eventually you reach a point where you're so the, the things that these uh, this impact this benevolent uh, dictator you know impacts are going to be things that are going to be widely unpopular. So they end up being overthrown, and the end you end up pretty much reinstating the alternative, which is a democracy anyway. So I think that as voters in a house that is broadly democratic, we need to believe that democracy is the best solution to climate change. speech um, I'm gonna have to leave it there um, as we have to bring the debate back to the dispatch boxes. Um, blame, blame Jenny for taking too long Freddie. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say anyway. Uh, uh, right it's time to bring the debate back to the dispatch boxes. Each bench has a total of 10 minutes to give their reply and we'll do a reverse order so I give the call to the opposition bench first to give their reply. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not going to speak, I think, for 10 minutes, uh, although I'll just check my time pulse. And uh, for the many uh, provocative um, statements that have been made, I think the most, uh, the strongest challenge uh, that I need to respond to is the suggestion that people might vote for policies voluntarily that are uh, not in favour of climate change uh, mitigation. That people might actually vote for parties that are populist and don't require difficult changes to be made. And I, I think that is a, a serious concern and uh, points uh, to a, fl a potential flaw in the idea of democracy. Um, I, I, I think the way to answer that is to reflect a little bit on, on the fact that democracy can be understood in two ways. Either it is a, a kind of imperative, a spirit, an ethos, a culture, a set of values, um, a, a way of life, um, an element of political conversation which uh, performs a, a valuable role. And on the other side, you can see how this sort of spirit or ethos is implemented in practice. And in my, in my opposition to the motion, I was very careful not to speak about how democracy is actually implemented. I didn't want to talk about the differing degrees of democracy that one might identify in various political systems around the world. It's certainly the case that many democracies that purport to be democracies perhaps are not by any stretch of the imagination. And perhaps uh, India would be a case in point. Um, and I mention India only because it, it was mentioned by a, a speaker at, at, at um, the back of the room. Um, you could equally level that accusation at the United Kingdom, for example. So, uh, um, there are many flaws, um, as my colleague Dr. Coles pointed out, with the uh, democracy in Britain. But um, I would argue that democracy is more than just uh, voting in a uh, for, uh, voting in an election. Democracy is a culture which involves paying attention to the collective, and I hold to that very sincerely. It requires everybody who is a member of society to pay attention and recognize, even if they don't want to, that the decision will be made in the interests of the collective. 
And yes, you do your level best as an active citizen to bend the, in, uh, the collective in your direction. Everyone is self-interested when they go to the vote. But you respect the, the outcome of the decision that is made. And at the moment of acknowledging that the vote uh, has fallen in a particular direction, then you succeed and you accept that, uh, um, that the decision has gone in another direction. And at that moment, you're paying attention to, to a group decision that has been made. And that, I think, is a very important factor. In any other alternative political system, uh, you are not an active citizen, certainly not to the same extent. And for that reason, you don't have to necessarily consider yourself uh, part of a collect collective unless you are instructed to do so. So uh, I think that's an important consideration. And so, yes, while there might be occasions when uh, parties vote in the direction of um, uh, an anti-mitigation of climate change, in the long run, people will be informed and uh, democracies cultivate a climate of openness and transparency and they facilitate the sharing of information, which is, as many of the speakers have mentioned, essential for understanding the science that lies behind climate change. And with that uh, emphasis on education and uh, sort of uh, facilitating learning, then more population, more of the population will become informed and more people will be able to make decisions uh, in the direction of uh, climate change. So that, I think, is, is a, a factor which I want to emphasize. But I think a really important thing which uh, is perhaps really worth underlining is that um, alternatives to democracy are bleak. And I don't think we fully appreciate how terrible they are. And so um, would you really give up that, uh, all the rights that we have within a democracy, meagre though they might be? And would we really give up um, our beleaguered democratic system in favour of something else? Because climate is not just a matter of science. Climate is cultural. Climate is not just about the weather, it's about how we feel and how free we are and, and how we comport our lives. And a climate of fear and anxiety and pressure imposed upon you is a miserable place to exist in. And would you really want to live in such a society? I'm afraid I wouldn't, and so I ask you really to reject this motion for that reason. I thank the opposition speaker for their excellent reply, and I give the call to the opposition speaker to give their reply and deliver the final speech of the debate. Go ahead. Um, to start with, I just wanted to say what an interesting, intelligent, thoughtful bunch of people you are in this room. I'm thoroughly impressed by all of the responses. Um, you managed to, to get your arguments together in very little time um, and then eloquently deliver them. So well done. I'm very proud of you all as a lecturer um, and feel a bit more optimistic about the future, given this is quite a challenging um, and in some ways, well, we'll leave it challenging topic. Uh, so I'm just going to respond to a few points which I picked up from some of the um, rebuttal comments. Um, I think this topic is an issue, and this is another very geography thing to say, it's an issue of scale. Um, so we had um, a, somebody talking about global versus uh, national government. How do, we, how do we manage the global system in a democratic way or using democratic systems? Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I think that, and one thing I didn't get to in my talk was um, the importance of scale. So I think we need to think about who, who are those populations who make up a, a democratic unit? Um, we need to think about communities of interest, communities where you have a, a boundary around people who feel responsible for each other 
can have some kind of connection to place um, so that they care about their, that, that local environment, that local space, and they act in the best interest of that space and the people in it. I think one of the challenges with, um, with the world as it is at the moment is globalisation, that, that we're very connected to so many different places that we've lost our sense of place and our responsibility for that place. So perhaps if we had more, more local democratic systems, and this is something that's very topical in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland at the moment, when we're looking at community land trusts and the decision making, maybe it should be at that scale, rather than, um, than Westminster controlling what happens in the Isle of Lewis, for example. So more local government, governance systems that are democratic, that could work. And I think there's, there's hope there. Um, and next, next, absolutely fundamental point, I think, is that nobody's going to care about their back garden or what's beyond their back garden until they've sorted out their home. You know, we have to support people to um, have their basic needs met, first of all. And this is something, I think, that isn't being addressed necessarily within our democratic system at the moment. And I picked on the UK a lot. Who knows if the next government, um, whether it be the Conservatives or Labour, maybe as I'm saying, they're going to be um, in power, but I, I think that's the direction. They might not be any better um, than the, the current um, government. But we need to, this is something that I come back to all the time, I'm never going to get anybody to care about the environment if they don't care for themselves um, and feel that they're cared for. So that's absolutely fundamental, I think, to any system of government. Um, and governance. Um, one important point is that um, someone mentioned about us reducing emissions in the UK and having done a fantastic job of doing that. Someone else um, sort of responded to that by saying that we've offshored a lot. What is really key and something that university is hopefully teaching you all is to be critical and to look at the evidence. Um, yes, we have reduced emissions, but where are we getting our goods from? How much are we offshoring? What other countries are dealing with the emissions that perhaps we could be, should be dealing with here? Um, because we've, we've moved um, uh, manufacturing elsewhere. So yes, we, we are doing a good job to some extent around reducing emissions, um, but we are offsetting a lot perhaps, or we wish we're, um, we're offshoring, um, and then we're also trying to offset, but I won't get into offsetting now. Another can of worms. Um, so yes, check on the data. You know, do, can we trust um, the information that we provide to us? Who's giving us that information? And that's your job, all of you coming here, learning how to interrogate, to be critical about evidence, um, to to check the data. Um, targets. Another point. Targets are great. We've all got targets, but how many of us meet our targets? I'm certainly constantly missing my targets, my deadlines, um, that, that's happening. The UN um, mission, we've got, we've got great targets, SDGs, brilliant. We keep kind of shifting the goalposts with those. So what is what are we, we saying on paper and what's actually happening in reality? And it's really important that we, we ask that question of what is actually going on on the ground. Um, there is, uh, I feel bad about saying that um, there are dictators I don't, I don't believe that that's necessarily <laughs> a solution, um, but it was a, a provocation. Um, uh, and that, that comes down to having really great leaders, which somebody said is probably entirely improbable. Um, but yes, <coughs> my, my response to that is that um, there, is, there is no one answer. Um, and we, we have to think about the leaders that we have and try and cultivate um, compassionate leaders, which you will have been when you leave this room. Um, interaction between civil society and governments, yeah, that was a really interesting point. Um, I think my hope lies in, in grassroots movements where, as I mentioned first, people are um, connected to their, their local environment, their local communities, and thinking about what works best for them. And that could be outside of the, the, the um, capital D democratic system, um, local local governments, local communities acting, which then could drive um, political change. Uh, it can happen in all directions, top down, bottom up. Um, we need to think about all approaches. 
And my, my final point, um, which was, yes, that, that it's important that we're all critical about the information that is delivered to us. Um, who's delivering it? What might be the, um, the priorities of that person? We need to interrogate the data and come up with um, our own solutions and keep holding people to account. Um, I think this, this point came up quite a lot. Uh, we need to hold our politicians to account. We need to hold each other to account, our communities. Anybody who's making decisions on our behalf, are those decisions actually serving us or not? And I think it's up to all of us. Um, we all have a responsibility to be an activist, um, to think about whether uh, decisions that we're making or that are being made on our behalf are working for us, for the environment, um, for future generations. And if they aren't, then speak up, do something about it. Um, it's going to be a, an iterative process of responding to the current situation um, in terms of climatic change, but also the injustices that we see that aren't helping us or hindering us from solving climate change. Um, so we, we all have agency and we have to use the privilege that we do have. I mean, we're all privileged being here tonight, learning, being able to discuss issues like this. And we have to use that um, in order to um, improve the situation for everybody. I have a speaker for the excellent reply. Um, thank you to all members of the House who have contributed to this debate. It's now time to call the House to a vote. So, please raise your hand nice and high if you support the proposition that democracy is not the solution to climate change. Great. And uh, please raise your hand if you side with the opposition that uh, democracy is, or rather, is not not. <laughs> Such a small speech vote mismatch. Um, and uh, please raise your hand if you abstain. Oh, that's all. Oh, oh, that's that's why. Why. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so before we announce the vote, um, we'll start, we'll do some uh, board announcements. Uh, Jen, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see so many of you here, especially with you know, deadlines and whatnot approaching as well. Um, I'd like to just start by thanking both of you for coming and speaking so eloquently. It's been wonderful to have you in what has turned out to be a really great debate as well. Um, for many of you have raised dissatisfaction with the way that what the motion was worded, but it's fine. We haven't we have taken credit for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but we are soon, after reading week, we're going to put out a little uh, Google form in terms of the debates that we're going to run for next year, so for next semester. So if there are any particular motions that you want to see, or, you know, better worded motions, um, then please do submit a form for that as well. So keep an eye out on our socials for that. It's coming up too. Um, next week is our last week, um, last debate before Reading Week, which is uh, this house opposes foreign ownership of sports clubs. And we've got uh, BBC's got lots of correspondence as well. Uh, Chris McLaughlin coming to that as well. So I would really encourage you to come along to that if you can spare the time. It's going to be a really great, great debate as well. Um, the other thing, which I'm very excited about is uh, we've experimented with different floor speech prizes across the semesters, um, and we've decided that next week, in kind of moving forward, there's gonna be a teeny tiny little trophy uh, for the best floor speech prize person to take home. So do come along and keep giving wonderful floor speeches. It's great to hear all of them, and, and lovely to have your participation. So thank you so much for coming. And then, uh, competitive announcements. Um, Alistair, do you want to go? Hello, I'm Alistair. Uh, I'm not head of competitive debating, but I, they aren't here, and I am the head of training, which is kind of the main thing that competitive 